Well, hello, and welcome to my garage. You may have noticed there is no verses today, mea culpa. I was off on a trip to Google with some of our friends from the Watchbox. We were showcasing a couple of our finest pieces at Google headquarters where we combined our analog with their digital. I got the full Silicon Valley experience, but I did miss a couple of days of production. Therefore, I'm coming to you live from my garage. This is The Weekender, and I'm going to go through a couple of topics that came to light over the course of several email correspondences. So you guys might note some of these topics are suggested by, well, you. And we're going to start with the way you've been spending my money. That's going to be our first Weekender topic. I've been on a bit of a collecting hiatus. It's been well documented. I came out and said I sold my watch collection last fall, mostly to clear the air, zero everything out, and reset my priorities. Focus on the profession, focus on my knowledge. But the bottom line is it's hard to be in this hobby without being a part of this hobby. Therefore, I've got watches on the brain and I'm approaching the end of my collecting hiatus. So you guys have suggested watches I should buy. Here with the most interesting watches you have suggested I should buy. Let's get started with the heavy metal. Uh, you guys have fertile imaginations, but then again, you are aided and abetted by the ultimate dreamer, which is why these watches at some point or another crossed my desk and my program on Monday. We're gonna start with the Debethune DB28 Digital, released in 2014. This is a variable geometry lug, 45 millimeter, grade five titanium grail watch from a company that, as I like to say, only makes grail watches. I love the piece because I adore jump hours. I like long power reserves. I love small independence, and I like companies that completely wipe the slate clean and start from scratch. It's not a vintage diver. It isn't a cloying play on current voguish styling cues. David Thune was doing blue fired blue back in 2004 before blue was even cool. So this watch to me represents David Thune at its best, an alien shape, advanced watchmaking, beautiful finish, and a complication that appeals to me personally. Now what's my damage on this one? Eh, you guys suggest I buy this pre-owned, but if I were to buy it new, it'd be 108,000. I kind of agree with you, pre-owned is the way to go, at least for now, before David Thune's secondary values start taking off. I think 55 to 60,000 would lock this one down, that is one watch that would have to hold me in good stead for quite a while, as that's a chunk of change. And while I've been saving all the same, that's probably my watch budget for a couple of years. Uh, you didn't hold back. The other watch you suggested was from another one of my favorite independent brands, the Hydro Mechanical folks from HYT. Now, it's no secret that I always admired the brand from afar, but I just couldn't get into watches that I couldn't wear. I can afford to put a 45 millimeter DB28 on my wrist because the way the lugs contract and expand to fit the wrist. But HYT's original cases were unwearable by anyone except maybe Shaq and apparently Axl Rose. But here's the thing, the H0 case changed everything. Lugless, completely round, and an ergonomic dream HYT has actually told me that they're going to be moving most of their production over to that case, which leaves you guys with a wonderful suggestion. On my behalf, you have already put a down payment on the HYT H20. Now, this is the HYT H20 with the movement, the HYT 210 by Audemars Piguet Renault et Papi. So this is old world finish at its best. It's gorgeous. You can loop it. It's sensational. The rounded lugless case, which has a wonderful domed sapphire. It's almost like you're looking at a case with the shape of a bubble on the wrist and as a result, almost completely scratch proof because that bubble takes the knocks. But you've also got the eight day power reserve. You've also got the dial side balance. And of course it is a regulator, a most unexpected regulator, but a beautiful one and a retrograde as that hydrofluidic drive jumps the fluid part right back to zero at the end of a 12 hour span. So what's my damage on this one? I'm going to go with my personal favorite version of the H20, which is the Time is Fluid. It's a limited series, 20 pieces. It is stainless steel and don't be afraid of the size. I'm not, 51 millimeters is the size, but 51 millimeters is the lug to lug. So I know that's about the size of a Rolex Daytona on a solid end link. The problem is the price, $115,000 and it is a 2019 model year watch. I have no opportunity to buy this one pre-owned. So if I were to go all in, I would basically be taking all of the money and then some I made from the sale of my watch collection and putting it back into a single watch. That's ambitious. I'm not sure I'm ready to make that jump. That said, the watch is definitely on my radar and the H0 is something I could easily see myself wearing in the next year. But for under 50 grand, that's an entirely different price proposition. I think about 
39.5399 is what they're charging for the H0. Now, jumping into another watch you suggested because you probably saw it on our website, the IWC Grand Complication, the 3770. This one's got pedigree, and this one's got wearable size, beauty. It's even a little bit understated for a true Grand Comp. It was designed by Hanno Bircher, the IWC stylist who designed most of their most notable watches during the 1980s. It had a minute repeater by a pre audemars Piguet Renoe Papi, so that's a high horology pedigree right there. Kurt Claus worked on the perpetual calendar. It is coordinated and programmed, and then it's built on a Valshu 7750, which I adore because that's basically the movement that I've got in my Zin Easy M11, and it's really a testament to how far you can take a basic ETA caliber and how much you can improve it to really make it your own. So folks who use a litmus test in-house, not in-house, they're not going to get this watch, but you guys suggested it to me and I'm totally into it. We've got one in platinum with a white dial that builds about 50 per metal per year and this is a 50 piece limited series. So I'm excited about this piece, about $80,000. I'm going to have to wait and see with this one because frankly you can buy some seriously heavy metal for $80,000 and as much as I love the idea of a perpetual calendar, an adventuring moon phase, a chronograph, automatic winding, and a minute repeater. It's true, it's practically an entire watch collection in one 42 millimeter case, but you're really putting all your eggs in one basket, as they say, or literally your dollars in one watch. So all of those watches, the HYT, the Day Bethune, and the IWC, they're on my mind and I'm thinking about it, but I'm probably gonna shoot a little bit lower to get back into the collecting game. So what else have you suggested? Well, middle of the market, what we would call probably the mainstream watch we sell here at Watchbox, You've suggested the Rolex 116600, so you've suggested I get myself into the late great three model year Rolex Sea Dweller 40. The 40 millimeter Sea Dweller, almost indistinguishable from the sub and probably didn't succeed because of that. People wanted the classical Submariner and they didn't see why you would pay a premium for a watch that looked the same but cost more. So here's the thing. It's now a collectible watch. It fits on my wrist. I've sung its praises before as one of the few actual investment prospects in modern Rolex that is a watch you can buy now that is not likely to lose value. But I'm not quite sure it's my style. You guys know I love the Milgaus Z Blue. I'm all about the Z Blue. I've said many times over, I'm gonna buy that watch as my first Rolex and I wanna buy it new. I want the full new Rolex experience. $8,100, the price is right for a watch with a five year warranty. And it's almost a little bit of an anti-Rolex statement in the same sense that a Prius is almost an anti-car statement despite being a car. The Z Blue is not the Rolex that the Rolex purist buys and I love it for that. Another watch that you suggested, and I'm actually in agreement with you right here, is the Omega Speedmaster Gray Side of the Moon. This is a watch that I adore in every way. I'm not a pilot's watch fan, but it's only a pilot's watch in the most abstract sense. This is really an all-arounder, a sports watch, a good time watch, and because of the grace and versatility of the gray tones, you can really wear it with anything. Plus, ceramic is super light on the wrist. So what do I love about it? Well, the price is 12,000 new. You can get it for about 8,000 pre-owned. That's a lot of watch pre-owned, especially right out of the dealer case a few months later. That too, with a five-year warranty, I would buy mine a few months old, $8,000, most of the five-year warranty intact, and enjoy. But there's a lot to recommend the watch. What's it like to wear? Well, for one thing, it has a platinum dial, frosted and blasted. It's one of the coolest looking dials, this side of the late great platinum dial Yachtmaster. I'll also mention that it is nicely loomed, white gold hands, white gold indices, and it features a fully loomed tack as well as a crown. How many watches feature a loomed crown? Omega really sweated the details with the gray side. It's a joyous celebration of the frivolity and fun of a luxury watch. It embraces that with both arms, and so do I, which is why I love this piece. I think you guys were spot on. I've also come to appreciate the scratch-resistant qualities of ceramic watches. Good ceramic, the way Omega makes it, the way Swatch Group makes it, generally is not gonna shatter. You have to do something stupid. If you're not the type to shatter a sapphire crystal on your watches, dial, you're not going to shatter a gray side, a dark side, a white side case. So I like the fact that this one is really never going to scratch your scuff. As I've worn my Zin Easy M11 with its tegmented case, I've really come to love the scratch resistance of a hardened surface. And it's even better with the Omega because it's that much harder being pure ceramic and 
The nice thing about that ceramic is you can't refinish it. So if you're buying pre-owned, the question's always on your mind, was this watch polished? When you buy a ceramic cased watch, especially a ceramic cased watch that's only a few months old under warranty, you know that it's never been polished because it can't be polished. If it looks immaculate, it's always been that way. And the newer watch is unlikely to have ever received a case replacement. Unlikely, but it does happen with ceramic. So I'm all about this coaxial chronometer, vertical clutch, column wheel, 60 hour power reserve, beautifully loomed, gray ceramic, 44.25 millimeter chrono. I love the gray side suggestion, guys. I think you were spot on with that one. I think of the suggestions so far, I'm probably going with either the Davithune, the HYT, or the gray side. Now you also suggested a little bit off the beaten path, but because I am in Pennsylvania and I'm only about an hour and a half from the factory, RGM and Roland G. Murphy, it's a small shop. They make almost all of their 801 caliber watch components and cases in-house. So you suggested I get one of the caliber 801 watches, and I suggest that that watch be the RGM 801 AS Aircraft. It's a really cool 42 millimeter stainless steel watch that is inspired by vintage analog aircraft gauges. 42 millimeters, nicely loomed. You can get the red or the blue dial. A lot of options on this one. Down to the cut of the teeth, to the hacking system, which you can get or not. Uh, highly customizable. You can choose whether the hours or minutes are larger on the dial. So you have your choices. And for $7,950 and the chance to pick it up at the factory from the men and women who made it, that is a hard proposition to refuse. 50 meters water resistant. It's not a full-fledged sports watch, but it is beautifully made. If you look at the case back and the movement, the hand finishing is the best you'll find this side of Keaton Myrick or... Pascal Coyon or Molnar Fabri. In the world of Unitas 6497-based calibers or Unitas 6497-inspired calibers, the RGM 801 is about as good as it gets. So I'm totally on board with this. I think there's an excellent chance I might add that watch and not too far from now. Otherwise, let's talk about the low mid-market watches you suggested, leading with Nomos. A lot of you said I should go with the Nomos Zurich Veltzeit, and it's easy to see why. I've mentioned the watch often on this channel as one of my favorites. I love the Nachtblau dial. It's sensational. It has a wonderful pebbly grain. It almost really nails their blues, and they've got a huge array of them, from the almost black Atlantic blau to the signal blau that you'll find on the club. So I love the Zurich Veltzeit. I think as a travel watch, it makes a lot of sense because I've got a lot of business associates and friends and clients, and you guys, of course, in Flor far-flung time zones, so a lot of folks I'm dealing with might be in the middle of the night when I'm in the middle of the day and vice versa, so it does help me to have a travel watch even when I'm not traveling. I do like the 39.9 millimeter case. I do like that it's under 11 millimeters thick. At $6,100, the price is right. I'm thinking about $4,000, $4,500 pre-owned. That looks like an excellent option. I don't like the fact that it's not a loom watch. A travel watch to me has to be loomed, so I would probably look elsewhere as much as I like the basic watch. You've also suggested for $5,480 the Zin EZM10 Testoff, which is best known as the celebration of every technology Zin makes in a single 46.5 millimeter tegumented titanium case. AR dehumidifying, it's there. Extreme temperature resistance, it's there. Tegumented case and that in titanium, it's there. A captive bezel, and not just a captive bezel, but one that is sapphire capped, it's there. Diapol, which is a diamond coated unlubricated escapement that also lends the watch a five year warranty, it's there. The SC01 radial minutes in house modification of the Valjou 7750, it's there. And the test off certification, which of course is a collaboration between uh, German universities and Zinn, a series of criteria for the durability and functionality of a pilot watch. This has the test app certification as well. So what don't I love about this pilot's watch that's also 200 meters water resistant? Seemingly it runs the table. Well, at almost 47 millimeters in diameter, it's probably a bit too large. And I have seen the watch in person, so I speak from experience. Could it be worn as an instrument comfortably? It could. But I'm not an aviator and I have no aspiration to fly. So for me, it would mostly look just a bit cartoonish. My 43 millimeter Easy M11 is probably the biggest Zin tool style watch I would risk. So, you know, the gray side, the dark side in ceramic, they wear entirely different. That test off 
Easy M10 is just a huge watch, so I'm gonna have to pass on that one, but if you've got the wrist for it, I can't think of a cooler watch to pick up. Now, more realistic, uh, turn back the clock to the 90s and what qualified as a pilot's watch back then, actually built for a French military contract and probably one of the last mechanical watches to be built for any defense contract anywhere, but the original Zenith Rainbow Flyback. 40 millimeters, it uses the caliber 405 El Primero with the flyback modification. The rainbow to get is the rainbow rainbow, the one that actually looks as though it has the colors of a rainbow on its dial and its bezel. Now this was the model that was actually produced for French naval aviators and French military aviators, I believe, were using this watch as late as the joint strikes on Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002. So it does have a modern combat history, and I would assume a combat or at least service-issued example that could be documented would be the one to have. Uh, most of them were not service-issued. They went to retail clients. So I would love to get into one of these. It's a borderline vintage watch. There are tritium dials out there. Oddly, the earlier models feature Luminova. The later models feature tritium. So if I could get myself into a tritium example for somewhere between four and $4,500, I would want to get it on the bracelet. I would want to try to get it unpolished, and I would want to try to get it with box and papers. So this is a very tough watch to to because you got to wait for the right one. A lot have been, shall we say, uncharitably cared for with excessive polishing. They've been sold too many times by guys who shift watches and always refinish. They've lost the original bracelet or straps, the documentation, the box and the papers, and these watches are now push pushing 20 years old and beyond. So the right one comes along, I would absolutely buy it. I think you guys are spot on with this. I would target about $4,500 by that one pre-owned. And this is why I have reservations about, about buying one of those $80,000 watches because you can get almost all of the mid to lower end watches we've discussed for the price of one of those big pieces. So moving on, I have to say that there is a watch that some of you suggested that is right along with my own personal tastes and inclinations and that is the Zenith El Primero Windsor Annual Calendar. We've actually got one right now with the smoked palladium dial. It was a 2013 boutique edition. I am really into that watch. 42 millimeters, El Primero base, stainless steel, smoked fume, Moser style palladium dial, and of course the nine piece Ludwig Oxlund designed annual calendar. I don't think you can do any better than an El Primero with an annual calendar. It's a good size, it's low key, and of course, the price is right, as you're gonna find this is what was originally a $9,500 watch for about $5,500 pre-owned. So it's a good price, it's a lot of watch for the money. I can't imagine someone going for a Rolex Daytona at, at full boat when they could have this without a weight, but that might be my gain and their loss. So good suggestion, guys, I'm on board with that one. Finally, we reached the bottom end of the market, but possibly, the top end of the fun spectrum. A lot of times if you buy a cool watch for very little money, you wind up enjoying it more than if you paid a lot of money for a lot of watch. So the first watch you suggested that I absolutely adore is the Omega DeVille Jump Hour. This was a watch made in about 2,000 to 3,000 pieces in steel and yellow gold back in 1998. It used a 2892A2-based caliber 1221. It was an honest-to-God tonneau case jump hour, and my choice would be to pick it up with the salmon dial stainless steel full bracelet. It's extraordinary. It's like getting a Breguet or a Vacheron for $2,000, and that's what I would want to pay for that watch on a bracelet. So good suggestion, guys. Salmon dial, full bracelet, stainless steel, get it, full boxes and papers, and a great example goes for two grand. Spot on. Good suggestion. You guys hit the nail on the head. I might own that watch. Uh, Giuliano Mazzoli. You guys are into the brand. I'm into the brand. I actually think they're phenomenal value. Obviously a design house, Italian designed, Swiss manufacturer. Giuliano Mazzoli, an old typesetter and printer who decided that in a paperless world, going into the watch business might be a strong play. Well played. I should also mention that the green dial that came out in 2016 would be the Mano Metro of my choice. Now, the watch at about 45 millimeters is large, but like the HYT H20, it is completely lugless, so it winds up wearing almost petite on the wrist. The double bolt Italian leather strap looks awesome. The blue dial, the green dial, I love them both, but green is my signature color. Yep, I wear them indoors. And the bottom line is that that would probably be my choice of the two. $3,500 new, you can pick them up for about $2,500 pre-owned. And that would be my preference. $2,500, Mana Metro, the original Giuliano Mazzoli from 2005, updated for 2016 with colorful dials, sign me up. 
The last on the list, you guys know me well. I've often said the X-33 is the one that got away. It's the watch that I wish I had purchased when I was in the Navy because I could have had it new with a warranty box and papers with the Kevlar strap for 600 bucks. And here we are now a decade after that missed opportunity and I can pick one up if it's the original X-33, the 3290, for about $2,500. The 3291 is a bit less common. It's the original X-33, but it's the Mark II. And it's the one that looks like it has the honeycomb crown. So that would be my particular choice. And I would probably target $3,000 for that second generation. And if you look, you can find that the D series, caliber 1666, Inside the X-33 was actually the only X-33 of the first generation that was also thermocompensated. The idea of not making it a thermocompensated quartz, they made it incredibly accurate. It was one of the most deluxe quartz calibers made in the modern era. But the thought was that no matter what, that watch was going to be worn inside a spacecraft or inside a space suit. So with that in mind, it was not thermocompensated the way, for example, Breitling's quartz chronometers are. So I would look for a Mark II X33 with the D-series caliber, and I would target about $3,000 box and papers, or to make up for the missed opportunity, I might try to find a service guy who is looking to sell one he bought. They did have something like a three-year cool-down period before you could sell the watch, but I'm sure between former Navy guys, it would be hush-hush. We could get that done. Uh, okay, so great suggestions, folks. Keep them coming. I can't guarantee that I'll be able to do a special weekender for every suggestion you make, but you had a lot of other cool suggestions like the Breitling Navitimer Spatiograph, the, the Swatch Diaphan 1 Carousel Tourbillon, a lot of cool stuff that I'd like to cover in maybe a second installment, but right now we're looking at maybe a cool independent like HYT or Dave Bethune or a bottom of the market hidden gem like an X-33 or a DeVille Jump Hour. Keep them coming. Oops, I told you this would be bootleg. Ran out of memory on the camera right there. Thanks so much for watching. Guys, let me know as I look to get back into collecting. I'm open to suggestions. What watches do you think should be on my radar as I re-enter the collector's fraternity? Thanks so much for watching. Please comment below and let me know. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on.